Hello, I'm Beth Ruyak, your host for this post-telecourse, Response to Improvised Explosive Devices. Explosive devices and the threat of being bombed are realities in today's world. Your safety as a peace officer or first responder depends on being prepared. Do not get caught by surprise. This telecourse will review basic procedures for recognizing explosive devices, how to properly assess bomb threats, the proper ways to respond at a scene where a device may be located, how to secure a post-blast scene, and the procedures employed by specialized hazardous device experts who respond to an incident with you. This telecourse has been divided into the following sections. Explosive recognition, threat assessment, initial response, post-blast response, and final thoughts. The main learning points include identification, field evaluation, and rendering safe practices. This telecourse will explore how basic procedures can be applied when responding to a variety of explosive devices, including conventional, military, and improvised explosive devices, also known as IEDs. The purpose of this telecourse is to challenge you to evaluate your own preparedness. As you watch, you should ask yourself the following questions. How can I recognize and identify an IED? What are the different types of explosive devices and what are they made of? What is the proper response if I were to find a suspicious package or device that appears to be an IED? When should I call the bomb squad? How do I decide whether to evacuate bystanders? What kind of threat does my communication equipment pose if I come upon a suspicious package or an explosive device? What happens when the bomb squad arrives on scene and what is my role? What should I do if I'm called to the site of an explosion? How do I set up a crime scene post-blast? And what are the different agencies that should be notified if there is an explosion and how do they work together? We will present answers to these questions and others you may have during this post-telecourse response to improvised explosive devices. Dispatch, Officer Brooks, I have an open door to the rear of the building. Can you send additional unit to assist? Hey, Brooks, what did you find? I was clearing an alarm call here, and I found this unlocked door. I need your help to help me search. Sounds good. I'll call it in. Dispatch, Officer Brooks, both units making entry. Hello, police. Hello, police. If you're in the building, identify yourself. Hey, Campbell, wait here while I clear this room. Got it. I'll watch the hallway. Hey, partner, why don't you come in here? I found something. What do you got? I don't know. It kind of looks like a science project. Wow. It smells like gunpowder and chemicals. Yeah. I wonder what uh, this guy's doing with all this. Uh, he's got a list of government buildings. What do you think? Oh, it looks pretty odd to me. Let's probably call a sergeant and have him meet us at the office. What do you think? Yeah, let me call him and get him started so that I'm not waiting okay. too long. Dispatch Officer Brooks, can you have a sergeant meet me? At back at the station. Look at this one. Take that one back. Why don't we take this one too? Sure. There you go. Let's Thank get you. out of here. Man, that place really stunk in there. <laughs> yeah, the sergeant's really gonna love this. Alright, well let me know what he says. I got another call. I'll see you at the end of the shift. Alright, I'll see you, buddy. Take care. Hey Sarge, come here. I want to show you something I found this last call. I'm not really sure what it is, but there was a whole table full of this stuff. It's, it was everywhere. I don't know what it is. Brooks, what the hell are you doing transporting an explosive device back to the station? Now we got to get a perimeter set up and get the bomb squad out here. Let's get away from it. 
unfortunately, the scenario you just saw where the officer brings the explosives back in the trunk of his car is not all that uncommon. Uh, I'm aware of an incident we responded on a few months ago where a small agency, an officer went out and picked up a live pipe bomb, put it in the trunk of his brand new patrol car, and uh, was going to transport it that way. Don't be lulled into thinking that patrol car offers you some safety when you place it in the trunk of the car. Leave things where they sit. We've had, I don't want to say hundreds of cases, but countless cases where an officer's gone out, he's seen uh, military ordnance, he's seen an improvised device, and he's said, well, I can handle that. That's nothing. I don't want to bother the bomb squad with this. They pick it up, they put it in their trunk, and they drive back to the station to try to find one of us. Uh, real story. We got a call one afternoon from a patrol officer. He said, hey, I've got a grenade I need to turn into you guys. And I said, okay, where are you at? We'll meet you there. He says, I'm at your back door. And we walked out, and yes, he had the grenade sitting right in the trunk of his car, and we handled it from there. Hey, partner, wait here while I check out this room. Got it. I'll watch the hallway. Hey, partner, when you come in here, I found something. What do you got? I don't know. There's all sorts of stuff here. Wow, it smells weird in here. Yeah. What do you think the stuff is? All these chemicals. I don't think I'd be touching anything. I don't know. I think we should uh, probably call the sergeant. Part of the bomb team, too? All right. I think so. Seems pretty good. Yeah, let's them. not use our radios. Let's use, uh, turn off our cell phones. We'll go next door and use the landline. Good idea. Back out of here. All right, let's get out of here. Yeah. In this scenario, the officer really does the right thing. He sees what he thinks may be components for a destructive device which qualify under the penal code for 12.312 PC. But remember, you may only see part of the components there. There could be completely manufactured destructive devices. There, uh, you could be in a dangerous area. So don't look too long. Lock it down, back out, and call your local bomb squad. Well, obviously, the biggest potential danger is, is that item going off. Um, and so, obviously, as soon as you find something, backing away from it, that's the best thing you can do. They, you know, they teach us in school that, that time, distance, shielding are, are the best things you can do. So, obviously, backing out, that, that's the biggest thing, especially if that item is found inside somewhere. Um, come back out of the house. Then once it's inside the house, it's contained. So, um, that, that would be the biggest thing to me would be just backing out. Don't go back down and take a look. Don't go back down to confirm that that's indeed what you saw. Um, anybody else who might be in the house or if it's outside around the area, just back people off. The farther you can get back, uh, the problems aren't there. All of the mom squad members on our team are equipped with cell phones. We have a duty person. Call, get a hold of the watch commander or whoever is responsible for making that connection. They'll put you in touch with the bomb squad, whether it's 1 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Call, tell them what you've got, and we'd be able to say, that's really nothing. You, you can handle it yourself, or that sounds a little suspicious. We're going to come out. I'd rather go out on 20 items that are really nothing than not go out on the one and somebody, either an officer, a deputy sheriff, a civilian, a fireman, someone gets hurt because someone didn't want to wake somebody up at 2 o'clock in the morning. Hello, I'm Bill Yockey from the San Diego County Sheriff's Bomb Arson Unit. I've been on the Bomb Arson Unit for about the last 11 years, 28 years on the department, and I was also a Navy EOD officer for 34 years, so I have a lot of experience with uh, everything we're going to see today. I think probably the most important thing that I'd like to get across to you is every piece of ordinance that you're going to see here has been picked up by regular patrol officers or narcotics officers or other people, they're generally the first people to encounter this stuff, so it's extremely important that you know kind of what it is and how dangerous this stuff actually can be. Military ordinance is designed for one thing. It's designed to kill people. And it's divided into families. And probably one of the first families that is most common out there that people pick up as souvenirs. They bring it home from their military experience. Uh, we have a lot of people that go out into the desert and find stuff. Uh, old construction sites. There's just numerous areas where this ordinance turns up. A lot of it very hazardous. A lot of it is deteriorated and any wrong movement with this uh, can be deadly to not only the officer but everybody around them. Now one of the other things I'd like to talk about that's generally overlooked by officers out there because they probably use them as kids and they feel it's kind of a benign thing but fireworks in general. What you have to remember about fireworks is they're basically loaded with explosives. And there's a lot of creative people out there, kids included, 
that understand this. Photo flash powder, flash powder, um, black powder, those are the three main explosives that are in included in fireworks. Once you get yourself enough of these fireworks, any of these pieces of military ordnance, you can actually load them with what you get out of the firework, and what you're going to get is that military ordnance functioning as designed once you're able to crank it off. So if you see this stuff out there, and if it's illegal in your county or city, make sure you confiscate it and be very careful with it. There's some types of these fireworks that are extremely dangerous. They're mainly those little poppers, small garbanzo beans that you see thrown on the ground. Um, it's basically a bean. It's coated with photo flash powder. And if you have this, some of them in a bag included with some of this other stuff, there's a good chance you can set that whole bag off by any kind of rough handling with that stuff. So be very careful with it. And again, be on alert. It's, it's an explosive. And understand that when you see people with it. Now to dovetail onto this, we'll talk about some of the homemade explosives that we're seeing out there quite often. Um, I think the, the standard bomb officer within the United States borders, uh, one of the things that we continually confront is uh, pipe bombs. It's uh, fragmentation producing. They can make them out of just about anything. Uh, generally the standard is some sort of galvanized pipe, PVC pipe, uh, small CO2 bottles, a number of things. And you can make a bomb very simply, a very deadly bomb, by having enough powder from fireworks or uh, bullets that you take apart or shotgun shells. You add them to a pipe, you fuse it, and you light it, and you have basically a bomb. A bomb being defined as something that is fragmentation producing. We see a variety of this stuff. And as you can see, People come up with all sorts of different pipes and different varieties and different ways to make it make it go off. All of them extremely deadly. We have guys that are very creative to the not so creative but just as deadly. Different types of timing mechanisms can be used on these things. Any kind of 9 volt battery, any kind of Christmas tree bulb to set off that powder and you have yourself a bomb. Some people get very creative and want to hurt more people, so you'll see something like this. You'll see something where they're going to add, actually add more fragmentation to scatter it. One of the other types of things that we're seeing out there, and people seem to overlook them just because they're small, are these right here. They're called crickets. Uh, what it is is a CO2 cylinder with the neck drilled out. They use match heads. They use smokeless powder, they'll use stuff from fireworks, they'll get it down in there. Problem being is they don't understand the dynamics of explosives, that they're set off by heat shock and friction. So as they're working it in there, they're creating that heat shock and friction. So we have a lot of kids walking around with a lot less fingers on their hand because one of these went off in their hand. Um, extremely, extremely dangerous, especially these because they're made out of aluminum. And as we know, once aluminum fragments, it fragments into a lot smaller pieces and they're a lot harder to get out of your, your body when they're trying to pull them out than metal. Another type of thing that we're seeing are these guys right here. Uh, don't be fooled by these. You have your acid bomb and your dry ice bomb. All this stuff, your muriatic pool acid, toilet bowl cleaner, a little aluminum foil, get a chemical reaction going. This expands and it basically detonates and fragments with a lot of this plastic going high order. Dry ice bomb, same thing. Simply putting dry ice in there and water and you get the right mixture in there, you're going to have an explosion. And again, I hope you've got a good idea about a lot of, the, a lot of this military ordinance that it is extremely dangerous and there is a lot of it out there. Everything you've seen here today has come from out in the street somewhere, either as souvenirs, dug up, etc., like I talked about earlier. But just to make you feel really safe, don't ever be fooled by anything. Here's a simple coffee cup that's been rigged as a, as a device. And if you think that got you a little bit unnerved, how about that usual cigarette pack of that, that doper that you pick up and you flip open the lid? Guess what you got? you're going to lose your life because you weren't careful. Just about anything you can see out there can be made into an explosive device. All the stuff is out there in the street in order to make that device. 
And as you can see, it doesn't take much. So be aware, be careful, and if you encounter anything, call the bomb squad and just don't touch it. PIES is an acronym that uh, we use to identify the various components of an IED improvised explosive device. Uh, the acronym means, means P for power supply, I for initiators, E for explosives, and S for switches. All these different components together make an improvised explosive device. The reason it's important for first responders to understand these separately and individually is they may have a situation where they uh, Inter, inter, intercede in, a, in an event where they're in the process of producing an improvised explosive device. And they may see some of these various components not together as an IED, but with other things that raise red flags, that give them an understanding that they're, they've potentially walked into a situation that could be dangerous. With patrol officers, what they should realize is that improvised explosive devices just aren't the, the pipe bomb that everybody thinks it is. It's not a, a six inch piece of metal with two end caps on it. Um, it it's up to the it, ingenuity of the, the person building it and nowadays with, with the internet and all the stuff that's available to kids they're, they're pretty clever with the stuff they come up with you're going to find ieds that are made out of plastic bottles out of plastic pipe metal pipe um, and the container wise it's it's completely up to their imagination it's whatever they think will get them the most noise or, or most bang for the buck so to speak it's important for first responders not to get tunnel vision. Remember, a bomb can be made out of anything. It's really only limited by the bomb maker's uh, imagination and the things that he can cobble together in his garage. Uh, don't think that it's got to look like a standard pipe bomb. It can be made out of PVC. It can be made out of a one or two liter uh, bottle. It can be really made out of anything they can come up with. California, unfortunately, fireworks are obviously inherently kind of boring, so people want to find ways to modify those. So for us, probably pyrotechnic explosive devices is what we most commonly encounter, and those are taking your typical over-the-counter consumer-type fireworks and finding ways to modify those to get more out of it, taking the powder out of those and putting those into other containers, or simply improvising powders that you see out of a recipe off the internet and you know you take some cardboard a couple of little things you pack it up with these powders that you make from your recipes and lo and behold you have a uh, you have yourself a, an explosive device so for us the most prevalent is is probably is is kids and, and teenagers messing with a lot of fireworks um, and then for from the adults they're still primarily with the pipe bombs either the pvc or the, or the metal pipe based pipe bombs It's very likely that first responders sometime during their career are going to get called to a residence where a citizen wants to turn over some type of military souvenir, as they call it. Remember, those can be extremely dangerous. We've had cases up in Sacramento County where one has sat on somebody's mantle for generations. Then when the family got ready to move, it got dropped during the packing process and a young girl lost both of her legs. Don't let the fact that someone's had it a long time or they've said that it was inert uh, lull you into a sense of complacency. These things are often uh, very, very dangerous. The most common things that we see patrol officers come across are um, military souvenir items, items that were brought home by people getting out of the service, um, frequently kept in their homes or their garage until they pass away. And when somebody cleans out the house, then they find military items. We also see a lot of pipe bombs of different types of construction because they're easy and the, the uh, ingredients are readily accessible. We also are seeing an upswing in chemical reaction bombs. Chemical reaction bombs can be as simple as a two liter plastic soda bottle filled with dry ice and water. And as the ice melts, it releases the, the uh, carbon dioxide. Eventually, the gas overpressures the bottle and causes an explosion. They can also be done with a number of different items, uh, toilet bowl cleaner, pool acid, usually used with balls of aluminum foil to create that chemical reaction that will expel gas that will eventually overpressure the bottle and cause an explosion. There are many different types of explosive devices. Patrol officers need to consider a number of factors when they come upon something that may be an explosive device. Three things that first responders need to be conscious of in an explosive detonation, whether it be a conventional uh, explosive detonation or an IED, 
are first off the heat. Um, high explosives create tremendous amounts of heat up to about 4,000 degrees. Relatively short-lived, um, not uh, necessarily a great fire hazard because the effects of the detonation oftentimes remove a lot of oxygen from the seat of the explosion, but it is still there a tremendous amount of heat. Second thing that they have to be concerned with is blast overpressure. Decomposing or detonating explosives create a overpressure effect uh, that radiates out from the seat of the detonation. Uh, the amount of blast overpressure is dependent upon a lot of different things, mainly the type of explosive, the amount of explosive, and to some degree the sort of location of the explosive in the event. The last thing that first responders definitely need to be con concerned with is fragmentation and shrapnel. And as a way of defining both of them, fragmentation is part of the device. If you have a pipe bomb, fragments that come off of the pipe are considered to be fragments. Shrapnel is something that is intentionally added to the device to increase its lethality, such as taping nails or bolts to the outside of a pipe bomb or placing them inside of an IED. Uh, fragmentation, again, is um, imp impacted, or the distance that fragmentation travels impacted by the type of explosive and the amount of explosive, and also the orientation of the fragmentation of the shrapnel to the explosive material. Frequently when we do arrive on scene as the bomb squad, we'll see a, a great perimeter established. Um, they've removed all the people from the area. They've either completely evacuated the area or sheltered people in place appropriately. But then we'll find officers standing way too close to the device or the suspicious item. They're within range of fragmentation or shrapnel should the, the device go off. They need to realize and understand that the blue suit or the tan suit won't protect you from shrapnel uh, or fragmentation. From a perimeter standpoint, um, we kind of go with the basic uh, catch-all of, of 300 feet. I know that's pretty common with a lot of departments. Um, essentially, that's a good starting point. We may come in, we may make it bigger, we may be able to make it smaller depending on what the item is and, and based on how we figure the, the, the characteristics will be of where it's sitting, is it outside, is it inside, but we really do like the 300 feet. Um, it's a great starting point and it just gets everybody far enough back for, for safety purposes and we'll kind of work it from there. If you, if you can't get the 300 feet, then obviously you want to try and take some cover behind something. You don't want to be standing 50 feet away from it behind nothing, you haven't accomplished anything, um, do your best still to, to find some sort of cover if you do have to be closer. Basic rule of thumb, more distance is better, substantial shielding, you have to use both of them in conjunction with one another to make it effective. There's an adage, if you can see the bomb, the bomb can see you. And the reason that we use that sort of analogy or that adage is that we have no way of telling, oftentimes, how much explosive, the type of explosive, the type of fragments or shrapnel that are going to come off it, and their orientation of the explosive. So there's the potential for fragments to travel a considerable distance at a considerable velocity and cause considerable damage. If you're standing there looking at the device, there's always the potential that you're going to be infected by the fragmentation of shrapnel. Recognizing the features and destructive capabilities of a wide variety of explosive devices is very important. Your safety and the safety of others depends on it. Some of the learning points covered in this section include don't mishandle an explosive device, don't touch it or move it. All law enforcement officers and first responders need to understand explosive device components and how they work. Learn the meaning of pies Military ordnance, no matter how old, can still be very dangerous. Know how to set up a proper perimeter. And if you have any questions, call your local hazardous devices or explosive ordnance experts. Responding officers and first responders must be able to quickly assess a threat and know when to contact hazardous devices teams. In this section, we'll help you correctly recognize hazardous situations and show you the proper responses. The goal is to prevent injury and death. Hey, 
hey, Sue. Mm-hmm, yeah. I've got the backhoe down there, and I almost ran into this large pipe. It's got these wires coming out one end of it, and... You ran into a pipe of wires out of it? Well, in the hole? There, it's this really shiny pipe. It has, like, this clock in the middle. These wires, I've never seen anything like it. Let's go check it out. Okay. It's got wires in it? Wires and clock. There it is, boss. What the hell is that? I told you, it's... I've never seen anything like it. i tell you what that is. What's that? That's Zedeker. Zedeker? When he was on his way out of here, he threatened to put us further behind schedule, and that's what he's put this here for. That's bullshit. You think that's a real bomb? No. I think it's... I think it's fake, like he is. You want me to just pick it up and throw it in the tractor? No, but we better not, though. Yeah. I mean, we don't really know. No. Maybe you ought to call the cops. I think you're right. All right, but what I want you to do is we're going to keep Johnny and Anthony working, but just pull the cat over here, okay. take that gravel, pile it up by the fence. Okay. And we'll have him, have him here. All right. Station H for 342 to respond to 700 block of 45th Street. It's going to be the new construction site called Matthews Construction. Good afternoon, sir. You call about the suspicious device? I did. Um, earlier today, I uh, had one of my men digging in the, uh, the burn over here. And uh, he stops, he gets out, it's like a pipe, you know, it's got wires on it. So he comes and tells me and I go look at it, okay, and I'm standing right on top of it and I'm looking at it. I'm thinking, well, I don't know. So I went ahead and called you just, you know, to be safe, to go look at it. But let me, t let me okay. tell you what's really going on here. Two days ago, I let a guy go, all right? And on his way out of here, He's saying, you think you're behind schedule now? Okay, you're really gonna be behind schedule. And I know that guy put that together, threw it in that hole, specifically to slow us down. Okay. Well, let's go take a look at it. Let me call for another unit first. All right. Central Officer Campbell on scene. You start another unit? Let's All go take a look. Well, so, what are you talking about? So do you have this guy's contact information? Oh, yeah, I do. Back okay. at the office, I got address, phone number. So here we go. Yeah, it looks like a pipe bomb to me. What's his uh, history? What's his background? Well, his history is its kind of a BSer, you know? He's claiming he's this big hotshot demolition guy in the military. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, well, hell, if you're such a hotshot, what are you doing digging holes for me? You know, in reviewing the scenario, the officer let the scenario run the situation instead of the officer controlling the situation. You get to the scene or you get to the location and the person says to you, hey, I think I found a pipe bomb or I found some explosives or I found it. Have the guy describe to you what he found. If you've got a set of binoculars and you can get a line of sight and see what's going on and get a good idea on it, that's fine. There's no need to go down range to go, yep, that's dynamite or yeah, that's a grenade. If you can see it, that's good enough. And always keep the rule of thumb is, if you can see the device or you can see the piece of ordnance, it can see you and harm you. So try to keep that in mind. The smaller it is, the less chance you have of getting hurt. And you wouldn't let a civilian walk you up to a homicide scene if it's still a hot scene. You're gonna handle it, you're gonna coordinate it, you're gonna get other officers there, you're gonna go in. Handle this the same way. You've got something, you don't know what it is, control it and make sure no one gets hurt. One of the things that concerns me is we'll get there and I, I'll say, well, where's the device? They say, well, it's right there by that orange cone. And I go, well, that was convenient. No, I walked out there and put the orange cone there. Well, that put the officer in danger. Or they say, well, I marked it with a flag. What do you mean a flag? And then you look out and they've got some surveyor's tape and they've actually put a stake in the ground and they've marked the location. If we get into a situation where I can't find the device when I initially get there and we're going to use the robot or maybe we're going to have the officer or one of the bomb technicians put on a bomb suit and walk down, I'll have the officer there with us and he can help us know it was a little more to the right where I saw it and we can guide the bomb tech or we can guide the robot in. The bomb squad relies on patrol officers to set the initial scene. We rely on them to gather information using their investigative and interview skills to glean as much information from people on the scene as they can before we arrive. 
who the property belongs to, what other items might be stored on the property, what other hazards might be present. The patrol officer has the ability to set a successful scene before the, the bomb squad arrives, and, and we rely on their ability to do that so that when we arrive on scene, we can begin our business of dealing with a suspicious device or, or whatever we have. Hello, sir. Did you call? I did. Uh, what's going on? Well, earlier today, a uh, guy running the cat, lighting his burn over here, stops, he sees something there, go, gets out, and there's this pipe, okay? He's got a wire out of it. So he comes and tells me about it, so we go take a look at it. And it is, it's a pipe, wire, it's tape, it's okay. got the stupid looking clock on the top of it. So, anyway, so I called you. But let me tell you what's going on here, really. All right. All right, so... Two days ago, I let this guy go, all right? On his way out of here, he says, if you think you're behind schedule now, you're really gonna be behind schedule. And I know that guy got in here some way, somehow, and, he, and that bastard threw that in there. And it's fake, and it's BS, just like that guy is. You know, and we'll talk about him more um, later. And as it relates to it being fake, yeah. it's not for you or even me to determine. Um, so, uh, I've got a few questions. You said you saw it, you described it. Can you give me a, the size or dimensions? How big was it? It's about a foot. Okay. Metal pipe, okay. foot, okay. about two inches in diameter. It's got a pipe, like I said, like a lame looking clock on it. I'm telling you, it's totally this dude, and it's totally fake. Okay, okay. Well, first thing uh, I have to ask is do you still have people working in the construction zone? Oh, yeah, I got like two. Yeah, oh, yeah, I got my guys here. Okay, and how far away is this device? Well, here, I'll go show you. All right. All right. No, stay with me. Stay with me. I don't want you going down there. I don't want to go down there, for that matter. Um, stay here with me, and just tell me how far do you think, distance-wise, it is well, from here. All right. Well, it's that burn right there. So what is that? Two hundred feet. Okay. Two hundred feet. All right. First thing we're gonna do is we need to get all your people out of the construction zone. We need to evacuate that area out. So these guys are unsafe to where they're at now from fake bomb. We don't know that it's fake. It's well, not for you or I to determine. It's right, for the right. bomb squad. So yeah, we do need to get your people out of here. It's very important for their okay. safety. You know, I got a lot of stuff over here. Can I get them, you know, out of there, work over here somewhere? You safe uh, over there? Sir, I appreciate your frustration and everything else, but we need to get your people out of here now. We need to move them out now. Wow. Well, how long of, you know, how long of a delay are we talking? It could be two, three, it could be four hours. I, I, I know, it's going to be a delay. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna have your work stopped. It's uh, I know it's gonna cause frustration for you, but we need to get your people out of here now. So let's do it. I'm get them out of here. Get them out of here now. All right. All right. All right. Oh, come back here. Come back here, and, and if you can, call them, or we'll contact them from here. Okay. Got it. Got it. Get Ronnie. We're moving. We got to get out of here. Get Ronnie. Tell him to come on out. Thank you, sir. All right. We need to get out. Let's go. Let's go. You think it'll be all day? I, mean, I think it could be all day. Be so honest, just let them go now? Let them go now? Yeah. No, because I have some, actually have some questions to see if anybody else saw something else that might have been out in the area suspicious. All right. All, right. All right. Don't be embarrassed to call your local bomb squad. Just run by them what you have. If you just want a little advice, just give them a call, tell them what you have, and see what they, what they can advise you on. Sometimes it can keep you from having to pull that big red handle and turn what could be a, a fairly small incident into a big emergency. Uh, your bomb squads are all seasoned officers who don't mind answering those questions for you. And it really can take a lot of heat off you later on when you say, I called the bomb squad and this is what they advised me to do. When we're responding to a call, um, it's like any other call that patrol would go on. We need the same information that you would give your cover officer coming in at a bank robbery where you're setting up perimeters, who to look for, that sort of thing. So for us coming in, as I said, we're looking for exactly the same information. Where do you want us to go? Um, which corner is the item on? Or is there a perimeter already set? Uh, are you within that perimeter parked right on top of the item? We need to know all that information. If you have witnesses there, um, hold on to those people. If you have the suspect there, obviously hold on to that person because we like to talk to them because we might be able to find out some information about it uh, that'll make us decide how to approach, approach a particular item. So treat it like any other call you would go to as far as the who, what, when, where, whys, and hows. Um, it, if you apply the same patrol concepts to, to any call you go on, they perfectly translate over to the same information we'll need and it'll make our job 100% easier. 
Military experience is very good for us, especially when we're getting our evaluations and they're telling us what they got in the field. If we've got a person that was in artillery or was in EOD, they've got a little bit better knowledge than your average patrol officer and they're able to give us some guidelines. What concerns me is, is they may take that next step forward and go, well, I was in the military and I know how to handle this. Well, when the military owns a piece of ordinance, there's a lot of safety measures built into it. Once it leaves the military's control, has the person taken those safeties off? Has the person modified it? Has the person done anything? We don't know. And so that's one of the major concerns is, yes, when it was in military's control, it was a safe item to handle at that point. As a bomb squad, we're going to take their information from witnesses or from the officers who first saw the device, and we're going to make our response based on the information that they provide to us. We're not going to go down and look at it, nor should they if they get a, a, a reasonable explanation of what the device looks like and it sounds suspicious to them or sounds like an explosive device, they should take that witness's word for it, call the bomb squad and let us take over. We won't go down for a free look and neither should they. Well, one of the things about Pandora's box or the Canadian training film is an officer for no reason at all went up and checked the device as he's looking at it no safety equipment other than what he normally would wear to go out on the street. He knew it was an explosive device, or he'd at least been given enough information to know that it was an explosive device. He went up, either he touched it, picked it up, uh, and, and he was killed. And there was no reason for that. Uh, we, I want to drive home, we use that training film a lot, especially with our base academy classes, is why go up? You're not going to go up uh, if you've got a sniper shooting at you. You're not going to go up with the equipment you have on. You're going to get SWAT or your tactical response team out there who has the specialized equipment, and they're going to go after the sniper. Why do the same thing for explosives? Officers or first responders should never touch or move explosive devices or suspicious packages. But what if there's an unattended or suspicious package found in a crowded area, such as a school, building, or transportation hub? What steps should you immediately take in this type of situation? Patrol officers are frequently called to an unattended package. That in and of itself does not necessarily make it suspicious. Where it becomes suspicious is based on the officer's ability to investigate the situation and look at the totality of the circumstances. A suitcase or a duffel bag left at a bus station may be something that just a traveler forgot to pick up as they boarded the train or the plane or what have you. It's the, the totality of the circumstances based on what the officer can, can gather from his investigation. Is there something about that particular item that doesn't look right? Or is there information about the traveler themselves and suspicious behavior prior to them leaving the item there? Sometimes it's just the location itself. Is it an extremely sensitive location? A power plant, a courthouse, um, county offices. The, the location itself can elevate something from an unattended bag to a suspicious device. A common call is going to be that suitcase or backpack or briefcase that gets left in a public place. Keep in mind when making some type of determination on what your next steps are going to be, is this simply an unintended package in a place that that package might be obviously left, such as a backpack at a school where 500 other kids have backpacks, or a briefcase at a bank where the person, where a number of business people are carrying briefcases? Or is it truly suspicious? And something that might make it suspicious would be obviously a threat has come in. Uh, maybe there's some type of labor, labor strife going on. There's been threats to disrupt business or traffic. Or is there something else about it that makes it suspicious? Is it in a high risk area? Is it up against a gas main that feeds an entire movie theater complex? Or is it somewhere that thousands of people are going to be walking by in a very short amount of time? Possibly there's a dignitary that you know is coming in at the airport and now you have this bag left there at the terminal. 
Those are things that you can start thinking about that really ramp it up from being just simply unattended to being suspicious. Whenever we get calls for any sort of suspicious item on a street corner, at a sporting event, at a at a racing event, there's there's always pressures to, to open the street. There's always pressures to, oh, uh, we can't stop the race. Uh, for, for those folks that work in transit areas with a major airport or a major transportation system, there's always going to be those pressures that, that you're costing somebody dollars, you're inconveniencing people. Um, what I would say to it is, if you think it's suspicious, then stick to it. And that's a situation that's got to be. Um, from the bomb squad standpoint, it, once we come out, that situation becomes ours. Um, the way we run it is there, there's no one else who can tell me what to do or how to run that from the, the mayor, the, the, the sheriff, whoever. Um, it, it's our situation and we'll handle it the way we're going to handle it. So certainly if you do have one of those types of issues where there is a lot of pressures, get a hold of us as, as, as soon as you can, obviously, to come out and, and deal with it. Once a patrol officer decides that an item is suspicious, not just unattended, they need then to take the proper steps to control the scene, set a perimeter, evacuate as necessary, call in for additional resources, the bomb squad, what have you. The officer needs to make those decisions and stick by them. If the officer has enough information to decide that the item is suspicious in nature, they shouldn't be swayed by school administrators or transit officials or people who would want to keep the area open. They should go with their instinct, go with their training, and set up their perimeter. Let, let the bomb squad arrive. If we concur with their items, with their findings that the item is suspicious, then we'll take the heat for having closed the area. Bomb sniffing canines can be useful in identifying explosive devices, but dogs will only be utilized in certain situations. If the package is unattended, it's a uh, terminal for buses or it's a, an airport lobby, and there's no other reason to say why that package is there, yeah, I say walk the dog by, let him take a look at it. But all of a sudden, we find out that there was a disgruntled employee that got fired, that's his lunch pail. He came in and sat it down. The, day, the dog and the handler should not be going down. That's a suspicious package. That could be explosive. That could do harm. I look at a canine like our x-ray or our robot. It's a tool. And we decide on scene how we're going to deploy that tool and use it. Dogs are great for searching large areas before meetings or if we have a political fundraiser or something where we're going to have high-profile people there. That's a proper use of a dog. But if someone says that package is suspicious, that backpack is suspicious, that dog should not be going down. Explosive detection canines are excellent tools in the toolbox that we all use. Their use is to do searches, wide searches of areas, dignitary protection, to be out in the public at the airport, the bus terminal, the BART system, to be checking uh, areas that are accessible to the public. But once an item has been deemed suspicious, a dog should not be brought back by that item. It puts the handler at risk, it puts the dog at risk, and it puts the public at risk if that dog does not hit on that item. Dogs should not be used to clear suspicious items. So once you deem it suspicious, take the dog out of the toolbox, that's not really available to you anymore. Um, the problem with a lot of the explosive canines is the handlers aren't bomb techs, so they're not that familiar with, with IEDs and those sort of things in themselves. And obviously dogs, they're not trained to every odor of explosive. They're not trained to every odor of chemical. Um, so that's the big problem with, with the explosive canines is they're kind of getting used in the wrong aspect. They're, they're perfect tools for, for sweeping areas before sporting events, sweeping airports, transportation areas, just as a general walking around type of situation. But once something's been called suspicious, they're, they're no longer appropriate. When determining the threat potential of an explosive device, don't forget, your goal is to avoid injury and death to yourself, other first responders, or to the public. As far as being hurt by explosive devices or, or in these kinds of situations, it's very simple to prevent. Um, just by backing off from it, once you, once you see that it is something that is suspicious or an IED, there's no reason to be standing over it. If you get that distance and it goes off, 
you're not going to be hurt. Officers have heard that you know putting the item in a bucket of water will render it safe. It doesn't. They also will cover it with something to minimize the blast. I've seen devices uh, at a hospital, for instance, covered with an X a lead x-ray blanket. Um, it wouldn't have minimized a blast had there been one, but it did severely impact our ability to x-ray the device now that it had an x-ray blanket <laughs> over it. Um, so they, they need to have their actions based on their training, not on rumors or, or old wives' tales that they've heard. We realize that sometimes in our busy jobs, our hands are sometimes working a little faster than our minds are. And we do things and we realize, hey, I think that was something I probably shouldn't have done. And often that happens with IEDs or anything that's explosive. So if you're searching somewhere and you've got your hands on something and you're moving it around, you go, hey, that might be a pipe bomb. Or your partner goes, hey, that looks like that might be dangerous. Just set it down. Don't take time, don't endanger yourself putting it back. Just set it down. If you've already got something in the trunk of your car or you've got it on the dashboard of your car and you realize, hey, you know what? I think in that video they said that that's not the right way to do it. Don't take the time, don't put yourself at danger taking it out of the trunk of your car. Just leave it where it is, call us, let us deal with it. Often by trying to make it better and going back and fixing it, you make it harder for us and make our job more dangerous and more difficult. First responders have to be conscious that the threat is out there, that the use of, use of explosives or improvised explosive devices is a viable, popular tactic. You have to approach every event uh, understanding that uh, a package sitting on a corner, a package sitting on a table, or something that is out of the place, out of place or out of the ordinary, could potentially be a hazard to the first responder. Not to necessarily overreact and treat everything out there as a bomb, but use common sense, use your intelligence, and react accordingly to what you've observed and, and, and understood about the event itself. I want them to know that if something doesn't feel right to them when they get to the location, back off, get a hold of us, let us come out. Tell us what you've got, but I want, and what you've done so far, and we'll work with you and help you out on any type, any way we can. And safety is number one for me, for both our team and for the officer that's out there. Explosive by nature are somewhat unpredictable. If officers mishandle them or take risks, they could end up with serious and tragic injuries. Um, the injuries can be disfiguring and permanent. Uh, they could be injuries that can't be fixed. Those types of injuries could end an officer's career and severely impact his quality of life. Responding officers and other first responders must be able to quickly recognize hazardous situations and know how to respond properly. Some of the learning points covered in this section include the need for you to control the situation, not allow the situation to control you, the responding officers play a key role in conveying important information to the hazardous devices team. Judging whether a package is unattended versus suspicious often depends on the overall situation. If you think you have an explosive device, don't give in to pressure from others. Canines are only one tool used by the hazardous device technicians. And above all, use common sense when it comes to threat assessment and the need to quickly call for the other resources needed to assist you. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Sweet. The initial actions you take once you've responded to a call will set the tone for the entire event. In this section, we'll cover the proper responses when you arrive on the scene and what to expect once the hazardous device experts arrive at the incident. Pipe bomb, is that awesome? Yeah, that's what are you guys looking at? Oh, oh my god. Yeah. Check that out. That is are you delighted? Why did you make it? I don't know. I, just, I don't know. I just thought I could, and I did. 
Oh, look at that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Oh, isn't that sick? Yes, yes it is. Oh, later, Sid. Okay, see you later. Bye. Bye. It's a pipe bomb. No, I, I was just going to show that. No, you can Are you serious? Yeah, you need to go to class. Go, go away. 2.42, respond to River City High School at 26311 Otai Road. 10.87 with the principal in the office. Reference a student who brought some type of device. They're describing it as a small plastic pipe bomb. The student and the pipe bomb are in the office. Jason, I see a lot of students in here every day. Some that I'm not surprised to see. This is a surprise for me. I don't know where this came from. I don't know what you're doing. All I know is this is serious. This is not something that we can just shove aside. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, officer. Hi. This is Jason. Jason. This is what was found in his backpack. That's a pipe bomb. We need to leave that exactly where it's at, and we need to leave. And we need to take this with no, us. No, you leave that alone. If you go ahead and step away. We have 2,100 students here that we've got to protect. We need to leave that exactly where it is. We need to evacuate this office and the adjoining office too. Partner, you take care of him. Come on, let's go. And we're leaving sure. this. We need to leave that. We need to, we need to leave right now. Okay. We need to clear out all the people from the adjoining office. Okay. Thank you. Ladies, you're going to have to come with me now. For how long? I don't know, but we need to leave immediately. So this is what we have right now. All right. Can you tell me uh, what the construction is of these buildings? Well, they're independent units and they're cinder blocks. They're pretty secure. So they should be pretty sturdy. I think so. Okay. What I recommend is that we uh, do a lockdown of the school okay. to make sure all the students are safe. Right. I'm going to call for the fire department, a supervisor, and an extra unit okay. so we can better assess what we're going to do next. Okay. And do we evacuate? Do we talk to parents? I'll, I'll, as soon as the, the supervisor gets here, I'll let you know. Okay. Dispatch, can you send me a supervisor, the fire department, and, and another unit, please? Additional units plus fire. Copy. We're going to have a seat. Watch your head. Just going to send a seat right there. Hey, listen, I'm Jason. Having these rights in mind, do you wish to speak with me now, yes or no? Y yeah. Jason, how'd you get to school today? I drove. What'd you drive? Uh, a blue Honda Civic. What year? 89. Where's it parked? It's over in the student parking lot. How many more bombs are on this campus, Jason? That was it. Just one? Yeah. Is it real? Yeah. Where'd you learn how to make it? I saw it on the internet. Why'd you bring it to school? I was trying to impress my friends. Do you know if your friends have any bombs on campus? No, I don't think so, no. Go ahead, put your feet in. Know to hey, find partner. parents? Let me yes. interrupt you, man. This is what I have. He drove to school today, blue 89 Honda Civic, parked in the South Lot, unknown California license plate. He said the bomb is real. He learned how to make it on the internet. Okay. He only has the one bomb, which we found inside of the backpack. He seems like he's pretty reliable. Okay. Well, we have a supervisor en route. Okay. We have the fire department en route and an extra unit. Uh, once they get here, we'll make a better assessment of what we're going to do next. Got it. The Hey guys, hey guys. Hi. what do we have? Well, we have a small pipe bomb located inside the principal's office. Uh, the, the building is evacuated. Uh, it's made out of cinder blocks, so it should be pretty sturdy. We are going to put the school in a lockdown, which will keep all the students safe. Now that we got uh, more units here, we can search the area to make sure there's not more bombs. We also have the fire department en route to assist us. Okay. Where's the subject detained right now? He's in my car. He drove a blue 89 Honda Civic, parked in the south lot. He said the bomb is real. He learned how to make it on the internet. He only has the one bomb, the one that we found inside of his backpack. He seems pretty reliable also, the information. Okay. 
So why don't we go ahead and do this? Why don't we go ahead and put the school on lockdown for right now? Okay, uh, we'll request additional officers and have them respond so we can secure uh, the campus and do a sweep for any secondary devices. If you can do me a favor, just hold off on contacting the parents, okay? And let us get all the emergency personnel in place. Okay, we'll go from there. You got it, thanks. Hi, Captain. How you doing? Hi. Just to let you know what we have going on, okay, we have a pipe bomb isolated and located in the main office, okay? The school is on lockdown. We have additional units responding to sweep the campus for any additional devices. So what I need you to do is I just need you to stand back maybe 300 feet and wait to hear from us, and then we'll go from there as far as the staging area. You got it. We'll be standing by. Okay, and I'm going to call the bomb squad, okay? Hi, this is uh, Sergeant Cook from River City PD. I'm calling because we have an incident at one of our schools. Hello there. Are you Jason's mother? I am. I'm Officer Brooks with the River City Police Department. How are you today? Good. Are you aware of what happened in the school this afternoon? I am. Okay, so the officer told you about what happened? Did. With your permission, I'd like to look around you the, the garage and his bedroom to see if he has any additional pipe bombs and or components that he may have used. Mm -hmm. Would you be okay with that? Yes. Okay, would you show yes, me his room, please? please? All right, thank you. The information on how to build improvised explosive device is easily available, especially with the advent of the internet. Um, I'm not sure how many hits I got the last time I googled how to make a pipe bomb, but literally thousands and thousands of hits. Uh, once you read a little bit of material and you understand the concept of how pipe bombs work, basically what a pipe bomb is, is it's a vessel that holds pressure that once overpressured, it fragments uh, uh, fragments apart, once you understand the principle, you realize just how many different containers there are out there that you can make pipe bombs into and just how easy they are to actually construct. It's actually very prevalent. Uh, there's quite a bit of, of information out there, both with the internet is probably the number one uh, information uh, out there, not right now. Also with uh, books, you can go to any, any one of the uh, gun shows or informations like that. It's, it's just everywhere. Um, kids talk back and forth. Uh, we've had several cases where kids just receive information from each other at school, uh, during summer camps, whatever. So the information is out there. It's, it takes you about 30 seconds to gather any, any information you want on just about any explosive. Uh, the most common devices we're seeing are like dry ice bombs or chlorine bombs. Um, and they're just devised with uh, the chemicals and like a two liter Coke bottle or soda bottle and uh, due to the chemical reaction, the overpressurization, that's what causes the explosion. The only thing that makes those so dangerous is that due to the, uh, the mixture, the mixture they, uh, they concoct within the device, it depends on when it's going to go off and also depends on humidity, air pressure, temperature, and so no one ever knows when it's really going to go off. That's what makes it so inherently dangerous. Uh, chemical devices, basically acid bombs. We're looking at mixing acid with with a, a reactive metal. The reactive metal cause, causes uh, it to give off gas, causes builds up uh, pressure, and it explodes. As opposed to the dry ice bombs, where you just take dry ice and water, put it in a put it in a bottle, and it it expands and explodes. The difference between it, dry ice bomb, you can set it down. It can take two, sometimes three hours to set off, depending upon temperature, whereas the acid bomb goes off right away. So if someone's used to dealing with dry ice bombs, and they've dealt with them in the past, and they don't know what they're doing, but they think they know what they're doing, they may go up on, a, on an acid bomb, and when the acid bomb goes off, not only can it take off fingers because, because it through the explosion, but it also spreads acid around. And we also train our people when they go over and find these things, quite frequently you'll find liquid no matter what it is. So we tell them to just treat it all as acid and that way they're safer. We see a lot of modified fireworks. Um, we see a lot of fireworks where people have cut the fireworks open to remove the powders to place them into some other type of container to create an explosive device. We also see a lot of times that the fireworks are used as an initiation source for a larger explosion. They'll be you know, affixed to some type of uh, explosive fuel or, or other items um, and using a common firework to initiate a larger explosion. 
Law enforcement academies often teach officers to turn off all their communication equipment when they're investigating suspicious devices. But many explosive device experts say that's not always the best course of action. The way it's been traditionally taught is that prior to arriving on the scene, about a block away, you shut down your, your cell phone, your radio, your pager, all the, all the electronics so that when you go on scene, you're not having to worry about setting off uh, the device through radio frequency energy. RF energy can possibly set off a device. It's highly unlikely. Uh, it takes quite a bit. Not only that, but there's so much uh, radio frequency energy in the air that if it were to go off, it would go off. So what we're telling people now is use common sense. Most of the time, if you have to shut down your, your radio, then that's going to limit your communications, and you may need that communications if you're dealing with a large scene. If you're dealing with multiple devices, too, it, you have to coordinate emergency personnel coming into the area. It's a, it's a safety issue. If somebody is actually running an actual RF device, then the, then the problem that you run into is they may be sitting across the street when you walk up on it. And that's personally my biggest concern. That's going to be a kind of a command detonation uh, type of issue. And if somebody's, and that officer's actually walking up on a device or a package, then if somebody's sitting in a crowd or across the street and he throws a switch, you've got no control over that. I don't think it's as big of an issue as, as having interference with the radio frequency to me as it is to actually have somebody to push that button while you're standing over it. If a bomb technician sees any kind of radio frequency device to where if it's like a cooler and has a little antenna or cell phone or and it, it could be remotely detonated from wherever, uh, at that time we back away right away because um, the bomber could be watching us, wanting us to get closer to the device so he could detonate it either to kill us or depending on what he wanted to do. So uh, we back away and we try to we, uh, handle those at a remote fashion. And uh, for anyone that sees any kind of device with antennas or cell phones or any kind of remote capability, uh, the, best, the only way to handle it is to back away from the device and uh, keep your perimeter as big as you can. One of the things I want to try to stress to patrol is leave a communications avenue open to us. If you want to turn off your radios, you want to turn off your computers and your cars, that's fine. But have someone away from the scene or directly around the scene have a communication open so we can talk to you while we're en route. We may be able to have to call for additional resources depending on what we're getting from you. If I show up cold to a scene because I haven't been able to communicate with people, we may further delay how we're going to handle this. It may require a bigger evacuation because now we all of a sudden we realize what we do have. So always leave us a form of communication zone. What we need from, from people on scene, we need the information as, to as much information on the device as possible. What it looks like, where it's located, we don't want to come rolling up and pull in right next to it. So they need to give us a staging area, a place that, that uh, we can set up. Traditionally, we tell people 100 yards behind, you know, set up your perimeters 100 yards behind cover. Bomb Squad likes that too. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up 100 yards behind cover and we're probably going to ask you to expand your perimeter out. Better to make perimeters too big rather than too little. When you make that call to your local Bomb Squad, some questions you can maybe be expected to be asked are, where should we stage? What's the best way for us to get in there? Oftentimes streets are closed off. We don't want to get tied up in that traffic jam or that closed street. Uh, we're going to ask you the specifics of what you've, you're reporting to us, the size, uh, the location, maybe who owns the house, have there been any threats, those type of things. We're not saying you have to do our job for us. You have to be the detective on scene. But it's those, those are the type of questions that you can maybe expect to be asked. And if you don't have the answers when you make that original call, you can call us back if some things become available that are important that you think we need to know, and we might change our response. When the bomb squad's called and we're responding, what, what uh, we like to hear is uh, more or less the same questions that you like to ask in your police police report who what when why how all those kind of questions we need answered uh, where is the device uh, do you have a reporting party who's seen the device did the reporting party or someone take a picture of the device yeah I would say the last thing uh, an officer wants to do is touch or move 
any type of device. Uh, a lot of times these things are booby trapped. Uh, there's anti-personnel switches in them. If you pick them up, they'll detonate. If you move them, you may start a timer. We don't know. Uh, and that's the job that we, we are, we're basically there for. Um, and so I, I would say try not to mark it. Don't put cones over it. Don't put trash cans over it. Don't pick it, move it to another area because you feel it's unsafe. Because obviously if you feel it's unsafe in a certain area, it's unsafe. And you shouldn't be touching it either. Uh, for the responding patrol officer, uh, what we don't like to see is if um, you sort of mark the device for us, if you go up and put an orange cone over it or a five-gallon bucket. Uh, a lot of lay people think that that's protecting it, uh, protecting the device in case it detonates. You're just adding shrapnel to it. What you're doing is if it's a steel bucket or a cone, uh, it, it hurts us in the, in, the, in the way that we can't see it from a distance. We, we will have to remove the cone to render it safe. Um, there's different things, you know, um, because if we can't see it initially we, from a distance, we can't figure out, okay, this is what we have. This is the, these are the tools we'll have to render it safe. Either one of us will have to walk down in a bomb suit or we'll have to use the remote capabilities like a robot to go down to remove what's been put on so then to take a look at the device. So it's always better not to do... Uh, to put anything over it. And the worst thing about putting things on it was um, uh, an officer would have to actually walk up to the device and put it on there. I think probably the, the, the single most important thing that they can do for us patrol officers is, is, you know, have that perimeter set up by the time we get there, have a safe area. Uh, because you, you don't know if this device is a time-related uh, device. It may be a, a fuse. We don't know. So I think it's important that you, you start that that uh, perimeter, get in this, the people, the public into a safe area uh, before it, anything else starts. Uh, obviously having uh, uh, locations for us when we get there, directing us in so we're not parked directly over it, which obviously it happens quite a bit. A responding officer may need to quickly decide if a location should be closed. It's a difficult decision that might be challenged by those around them. Well, when patrol shows up to a scene and determines that the item needs to be looked at by a bomb squad or needs some further investigation in any way, there's going to be pressure. There's going to be pressure to get things moving. Let's get this scene going. Um, in particular, for us in transportation, that's what we do. We move people. They want things moving. They want it going right now, yesterday. So the officers get a lot of pressure to get there and make a snap decision on something, and sometimes could be forced into doing something they shouldn't be doing as far as maybe moving the item or opening the item, which is never a good idea if it truly is suspicious. So it's important to step back, think about exactly what's going on, and determine, hey, is this something that needs to, needs to be opened? Is it, is it ready to go? Is it just unattended and you've made that ter determination? Or are there other factors in play to, to make you think that this is a truly suspicious item? And if you think that, there's no reason to touch this thing. There's no reason to go near it. You may be called upon to make some uh, big decisions once that package is deemed suspicious out there in that public place. Try not to succumb to uh, political pressure, economic pressure, to get that street open, get that train uh, platform open. Once you deem it suspicious, get hold of your supervisor if necessary, call the bomb squad, let the bomb squad take heat off you. Explain to the bomb squad why you think it's suspicious. Once the bomb squad's en route, then it's on them. Let them come out and do their job. Let that bomb squad supervisor take the heat from you, and then you just do your job. If, if you have an unattended package, that's just found property. It's been laying there. That's fine. If it's a sus suspicious package, you might have an explosive device. All bets are off then. We're dealing with a crime. This is a crime scene. You don't normally move a crime scene just because some, uh, someone wants to open their business or a road needs to be opened up. You finish your investigation. If you need help, the you call the bomb squad. The bomb squad's coming out. Let the bomb squad be the bad guys. They will come out. They will set up the perimeters, make sure everything's done. So if someone's pressuring you to, to move the device or to let them open up the business, you just explain to them, I've got to wait till the bomb squad. They've instructed me to establish a perimeter and let nobody in. The patrol guy responding to one of these calls, it's going to be important for him to get as much information as they can when they show up to the scene. 
If they can get information from people that had seen the item before they even get to it, that's the best case scenario. So they have a general idea and understanding of what they're going to be looking at when they go. Or if they get enough information that this thing is truly suspicious just from the description alone, that should be enough to where they're not going to have to go in there and put themselves in danger to look at this item. The bomb squad's also going to rely on the patrol officers to keep a hold of the people that they've gotten information from. The bomb squad may have further questions that the patrol officers haven't thought of, or we may want to talk to somebody and get a first-hand account of what they've seen or what they know about the situation. If they've been released from the scene, we don't have the ability to gather that information. Remember, when you come across one of those situations where you're really not sure what you should do, you can always call your local bomb squad. Your department Procedures may say you need to contact your supervisor first, which we understand. But at somewhere, somewhere down the line, that bomb, your bomb squad should be called. You can always call us and ask us for advice. I get a lot of calls where people are just asking for advice on things, on this is what I think I might have, or this is what I saw yesterday. Don't hesitate to call your local bomb squad. First responders must often make crucial decisions while waiting for the bomb squad to arrive. One of the most important is whether to evacuate a public space, like a school, business, or transportation system, or to have people remain where they are in what is known as shelter in place. Can you tell me uh, what the construction is of these buildings? Well, they're independent units and they're cinder blocks. They're pretty secure. So they should be pretty sturdy? I think so. Okay. In this particular scenario at the school, the officers use good judgment. They took into consideration the size of the item and decided how their evacuation should proceed from there. Often we see people evacuated out of buildings which would give them much protection into open areas which give no protection but are a little further away. And we really question sometimes why those take place. Remember, sometimes sheltering in place is the best option. Things to consider are, what's that building made out of? In this particular scenario, I believe it was cinder block. Obviously, cinder block would give quite a bit of protection from a pipe bomb. So keep in mind, size of the item, type of the building, distance, those things are all important when deciding what your evacuation perimeters should be. If you're going to evacuate a school, and again, given the size of the device, it would be better to shelter the folks in place, the kids in place, make sure that officers go out or school administrators, custodians, anyone in the school that knows the area, they can go out and do their own physical inspection of it. And once they've deemed that there's nothing out there that is out of the ordinary, then go into your evacuation procedures, then send them out there. If you find something out there, you should have a secondary evacuation location. In a situation where uh, a device was uh, at a residence, uh, we can use a pipe bomb per se, um, we always uh, like to evacuate the houses uh, directly behind to the sides and in the front because no matter how, if the device uh, detonates, it'll always follow the path of least resistance. If there's a hallway, it would shoot down, or if it would shoot out a garage, it would shoot out toward the front of the residence. But the, if there was also a garage opening or a rear door, there would be shrapnel going out there. We'd be traveling there as well. So we would be traveling out the windows. Uh, and a pipe bomb, uh, the shrapnel, on average, depending on how the pipe bomb's constructed and, and what's utilized as, as far as the explosive, it could, it could, uh, the shrapnel could travel almost 2,700 feet per second, and that's uh, pretty quickly, and that'll go through a lot of sheetrock and different things like that. So um, as far as perimeters, if some is good, more is better. When it, it comes to the actual patrol officers responding to these areas, uh, they, they really have to stand firm when it comes to the political pressures. Uh, of opening streets and, and not evacuating different buildings. And, uh, you know, I understand that there's economic loss sometimes if you're shutting down, you know, a high-tech building. Uh, but again, uh, how much is a human life worth? And, you know, if they have issues with that, obviously, you know, when you call the bomb squad, the first thing the bomb squad is going to tell you is either evacuate, and they're going to probably tell you, depending on the device that you have, how far that you're going to need to evacuate. It may not be in an entire building. It may be a small area. Uh, but then again, you may have to shut down an entire business. Uh, and yeah, there's economic uh, issues involved. 
but uh, our concern is, is public safety. The safety of the public and other first responder personnel should always be an officer's primary concern. Some of the learning points covered in this section include how simple and easy it is to research information about explosive devices and obtain detailed information on how to build one. Don't automatically turn off your communication equipment when investigating a potential explosive device. Be ready to communicate essential information to members of the bomb squad. The discovery of a suspicious package or potential explosive device makes the location a crime scene. Don't bow to pressure to open the scene before appropriate hazardous device experts have arrived to assist you. And know when to evacuate versus shelter in place. How should you respond when you get a call that there's been an explosion? In this section, we address the proper actions for responding officers or first responders after an explosion has occurred. subject next to the vehicle. We do have the fire department responding and the RP is still landline getting further. Hey, what happened? Somebody threw a bomb in my car. Bomb? Well, that doesn't look like there's something else going on here. So we, we need to get out of here. Okay. It looks unusual then. It does. Adam 12 uh, with an update from Monroe Industries. We've got a uh, possible car bomb here. Victim indicates someone threw a bomb into their car. River City Fire also confirms the same thing. Any responding units to uh, help set up a perimeter, we're also gonna need to uh, have a command post set up. I'll advise on the location of the command post. Guys, hey, we need to get out of here. Come on, everybody move. We're gonna go behind this building over here. Anyone see what happened? Okay. Hurry up, guys, if you can, please. We need to get out of here right now. What'd you see, ma'am? What do we have? Hey, Sarge. When I got here, I spoke with the victim. Mm -hmm. He told me that someone threw a bomb at his vehicle and it detonated. Okay. I also spoke with the fire captain. He told me that it was a little suspicious the way the debris was spread. Didn't think that it was just a vehicle fire. Mm -hmm. We've got nine witnesses over here. I've got them kind of squirreled away. We're waiting for some other officers to show up so they can interview them. Okay. Our perimeter is set. We do need some more officers to help with the perimeter. The victim is en route to the Memorial Hospital. We need someone to go there and interview him as well. I don't know how you feel about this as a command post, but we've got this building here shielding us from any other secondary blast. Mm -hmm. The area has also been searched for secondary devices. I think this might work. What do you think? Okay, we'll use this as the incident command post right now until we get a vehicle down here. Uh, that sounds pretty good. Jones, can I get you to go ahead and assist with uh, closing off the, uh, the area where the blast occurred? Go ahead and uh, get a couple extra units. I want you to go ahead and seal off the area for all en entrance and exits of the vehicles and pedestrian access as well. Uh, make sure it's a, it's a large uh, contained area in case we have a larger uh, crime scene than we think we have currently, okay? Uh, you got it, I'm in route. Thanks. That'll do it. Sarge. Hi, yeah. Bomb squad. Hi, yeah. How you nice doing? Awesome. Hey, Greg. Glad what you make. What do we got? I arrived and spoke with the victim who told me that someone threw a bomb at his car and it detonated. Fire department kind of confirmed that it was a little suspicious the way the fire was started on the car. They're en route to the hospital with him. We've got witnesses behind me that are willing to give statements. We have officers en route to take some statements from them as well. Our perimeter is set. 
We've got some more additional officers come in to maintain that perimeter. Uh, I did a brief secondary search for devices, didn't find anything. Hopefully your team can come in and assist with that as well. Okay. Um, if we could request PDK-9 to go ahead and do a sweep for secondaries in this general area. And are we okay with you utilizing this as the unified command post so that uh, we can use this as the organizational point and I'll establish my tactical command post up here on the right about 200 meters out? Definitely. Sounds okay. great. Okay, what I need you guys to do is I need you to assist with taking uh, uh, witness statements. We've got a lot of witnesses, so I need you guys to help focus on that. If you could do that, that'd be perfect. Let me know if you need anything, okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. Sergeant, if we could go ahead and secure those witnesses even after they make their statements, there we'll might do. be some questions that I need to go ahead and uh, ask them before we go downrange. Uh, okay. What I'm going to have to do is myself and my partner are going to have to go down in the bomb suit. Um, I'm going to go down in the bomb suit. I'm going to search for any secondaries inside the vehicle. I'm also going to look for anything outside of the box inside the vehicle. And, uh, and I'll brief you when we're going to go downrange. But when I do go downrange, we'll let you know. Make sure that nobody inside the perimeter is utilizing any radio devices. Okay. And we don't use any radio communication amongst ourselves. And then once I come back outside of the box, then uh, we can go ahead and resume completely normal. But anybody outside the perimeter is okay. Anybody that is inside the perimeter, I don't want them using any type of radio devices while I'm down on the device. Okay, understood. Okay. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, Sarge, I think we should get that statement back from the hospital as soon as possible. So maybe we should uh, get in contact with the officers out of there and find out what, uh, what information we have from the victim as well. Do we have the victim's uh, info yet, and have we ran them? Uh, medical took them out so fast. I wasn't able to get any information. Okay, we run the vehicle yet? No, sir. Okay, let's get on that then. And uh, let me make some phone calls to command staff. I'll get back to you in a couple minutes, okay? okay. Thank you. Sorry, hey, how's it going, Campbell? I'm going to go ahead and place you with the EOD guys. Okay. I want you to stay with the, the, the bomb unit, okay? If they need anything at all, let us know immediately. That way there's a radio with them that can communicate with all of our uh, units in the field as well, so we can coordinate with them if that's good. Got it. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Can you please tell me what you saw, what happened? We were just walking across the, uh, the parking space and just looking around and all of a sudden, boom, this explosion happened. And we, we took off running. I, I was just in shock. Do you know what exploded? What is it, a trash can? Was it uh, a briefcase? It, it seemed like it was the car. Was I, don't car? Yeah, I don't do know. Do you know what kind of car exploded? No, officer, I couldn't tell you. Was anybody around in the area besides the people that were with you? Was anyone near the explosion? Not, not that I recall. No, I. We were just like I said, out kind of talking, joking around, and boom, this no, thing went out and just took us by surprise. Okay. I don't did you hear anybody around? Did you hear any other explosions in the area? No. Did you uh -uh. see any or, or no. see any explosions there? That was no, it. No, that was it. Okay. Totally took me by surprise. Did you see anybody near the vehicle at the time of, you were walking by? Um, no, I didn't see anybody near it. Uh, the, the young lady I was with, she said she saw somebody in the car, I think, before it happened. As you were um, walking by, did you see anything thrown at the vehicle or near the vehicle? No, there was nobody near it uh, but us. I think we were the only ones around, actually. Okay, um, and after the explosion, then what did you do? Oh, we ran. We got away from there. We didn't know what else was going to blow up. There could be more. So. I see. After the, the After it exploded, then did you come back and take a look to see what happened? Oh yeah, we did actually. Yeah, I got some really good pictures on my on my camera phone too of the car. So that was that was a mess of an explosion. Great, thank you. So I'm going to take some of your information down oh, and okay. put it into a report. I also need the video or the pictures that you got too. Oh okay, okay, Great. not a problem. Thank you for all your help. All right, no problem. So how are we doing right now as far as our witnesses? Well, the officers just finished the interviews. I'm going to see what they say, see if there's any conflict information in there, and uh, once we get that, we'll be set. Excellent. Yes, sir. Sarge, I just got back from getting out of the suit. I talked to my partner. Um, 
We, I searched the area for potential secondaries and uh, I didn't see anything. What's sitting on the passenger seat is a child's toy remote control mm -hmm. device that you would have like an RC car or something like that. It's partially burned. And what I also noticed was a, uh, a partially um, a low order PVC pipe bomb sitting right in the center console. So it looks like a definite bombing. Um, the device is safe. Um, Let's go ahead and utilize K9 to sweep the rest of the parking lot for any okay. type of secondaries. And um, the victim appears to prematurely have detonated a device of his, his, his own making, okay? So I believe that the victim is now a suspect, so I would go ahead and treat that accordingly. Okay. Um, the other thing is, is that the, uh, we need to go ahead and preserve that scene as evidence. So what mm -hmm. we need to do is push the perimeter, the inner perimeter, out to one and a half times the distance of the frag that we see farthest out, one and a half times that. And then we need to let ATF and uh, FBI get involved, and we need to do a post-blast investigation. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, Rogers, why don't you help him with that? Let me call the incident hospital really quickly. Okay. Oh. Yeah, this is Sergeant Gutierrez. What I need you guys to do is, is that your victim is potentially the suspect per EOD units. So we're going to go ahead and detain him there. Let me know as to any changes in his condition, and we'll call you back in just a couple of minutes. Thanks. Okay, our hot wash on this incident. First off, from the bomb squad perspective, the first in officer did an outstanding job of securing the scene and realizing what we had is an explosive incident. And uh, as always, officer safety and civilian safety is our utmost concern. So you did an outstanding job of taking care of that. Sarge? Well, excellent. I think we had a really good uh, response from allied agencies in responding to assist us with this. We were able to cordon off the area, and we had a timely response from other agencies to assist. Outstanding. The Unified Command Post, another great thing. It uh, definitely worked well. Uh, all the agencies interacting. Um, the secondary sweep to make sure it was clear. Felt very safe operating back here. And then our tactical command post being a little bit distance away gives us a buffer space to work so it doesn't look like we have people over our shoulder. And we communicated effectively back and forth, us letting you know what was going on, what our intention was, and then you letting us know what the resources and what you needed from us. Well, I'm glad we could help you guys in that. We really were glad and we were able to support your mission. Well, it's definitely a team approach. Um, we, we can't do this by ourselves. We have to do it as a team. Um, the other thing that I noticed was the perimeter control. We had no problem with people coming in inside the perimeter while I was downrange or while we were working. Outstanding job of controlling that, especially with the officers that you placed along the perimeter. Okay. Um, the communication aspect, all incidents have communication problems, but we established a, an incident command channel. Uh, we went in and took care of that. We communicated effectively and we worked well as a team. I, I can't say more about that. Excellent. Um, and then a final perspective from the bomb, bomb squad. Once we deem this as a crime um, and we deem it as an explosive crime, the evidence preservation and the control of that is utmost. With the FBI and the ATF being involved, with the investigation on the process, with the witnesses segregated so that we can talk to them, not to mention your officers making sure that they don't trample in the crime scene, that everything is evidence. Uh, it just it worked to the point where uh, when we go ahead and we put this all together, I think we'll have a conviction. Excellent. Well, thank you. We appreciate everyone responding in a timely manner. I have everyone's business card. Uh, we're going to break down the scene, and we'll give you guys a call probably first thing in the morning. All right. Thanks, thank you. Sarge. It was a great it. job. Thanks. In essence, uh, I think that the responder is probably going to get the radio call of an explosion, and that's going to be very intimidating uh, by itself. Um, it's going to bring feelings of maybe overwhelmingness, uh, maybe to the point of almost causing paralysis. Uh, you're going to vapor lock. Um, but it's important to keep in mind, just like you would be responding to an armed robbery in progress, this is no different. Uh, it's just a, a different incident that occurred. You still need to get to the scene safely. Uh, you still uh, need to evaluate the scene when you get there. Um, you still need to tend to victims that may be down, uh, suspects that may still be in the area, separating of witnesses, uh, isolating the scene, setting up a perimeter. It's no different than a major crime that occurs that most police officers respond to in the uh, course of their daily uh, duties. Some of the things that officers need to be thinking about while they're en route to 
the call is, first off, is it a natural explosion? Is it going to be a crime scene where, you know, it's, it's a domestic issue, such as maybe a, a family disturbance, a, a 415 family where a spouse is targeting a specific spouse, or is it an act of international terrorism? There's a lot of things that they're going to need to really focus on and be open to and be flexible to once they arrive on scene. Again, it's like any other call. When we get dispatched to it, we generally don't have all the facts, so officers need to remain open and flexible. Dispatch tends to um, give you um, the information that they have, and sometimes if you have a while to get to the scene or uh, have to drive to the scene, you can request further information, such as, has fire been dispatched? Is there incident commander on the way? Has a bomb squad been notified? Were there any um, um, injuries or major property damage? One thing that you really, really need to be careful of is, especially if this is an area that you regularly patrol, is just keep track of how, if you end up going to the same address for the same sort of thing multiple times. Uh, we know for a fact that uh, terrorist organizations really do study our response routes, our response times, uh, how we set up, how we do business. We, we've watched when they call us back to the same scene three days in a row. Maybe it's a different crew, so they see uh, so they can see if we get some sort of pattern. So we are very cognizant of the addresses that we go to, what sort of uh, incidents we're running on. So even as much as setting up the command post in the exact same spot every time um, is, is something you have to be careful of so that we don't uh, fall into a pattern that we can be ambushed. They need to be aware of secondary devices, whether they're going to be concealed in cars, whether they're going to be concealed in any evacuation points. If we're responding to a, a high school where there's a bomb threat, before I move anybody out of the school into an evacuation area, I need to make sure that there's no other devices there. In most bombings, and I would say 95% of the bombings, there's always at least two crime scenes. There's where the bomb went off and where the bomb was made. And in between there, there's a whole lot of variables. It could be where there's multiple bombers. It could be where the suspect is hiding additional devices. It, it, with the exception of he's making a bomb in his garage and that's where it blew up, 95% of the time you're going to have multiple crime scenes. And you have to think about that. While you're working on one scene, is evidence being destroyed at another scene? Are people fleeing that scene? You know, is there other exigent circumstances that allow you to respond to that scene immediately and start getting in there? One of the potential hazards that you're going to encounter in a detonation is glass hazards, falling glass hazards. That's really important in California because the number of major metropolitan areas where you have multiple story buildings is considerable. Uh, as a rule of thumb, it only takes about one PSI to break glass. If you detonate an IED, improvised explosive device, in an area where you have multi-story structures, uh, the blast pressure is going to radiate, radiate out from the center of the detonation. One PSI is going to travel a considerable distance. So although you may be far enough away that the blast pressure isn't going to do anything specifically to you as a human, easily can break glass, glass falls down from, uh, from upper stories and causes a tremendous number of injuries. Major problem that they had in Britain during uh, the uh, bombing campaign of the IRA. Uh, when an officer responds to an incident, uh, there are several things that the officer will need to keep his eyes open when he's entering the scene. One of the main things is what's what's around? What's Are there powders around? Are there uh, large volumes or amounts of hydrogen peroxide, acetone, sulfuric acid, stuff that's not natural to have in that environment? Um, and that, that could indicate the possibility of this being an explosive laboratory or a, uh, a kitchen chemist, so to speak. Uh, if you come into an area where there's absolutely no physical evidence, all the walls are down, and, and you smell gas or something, well, then maybe it's more of an ex, uh, a gas, a natural gas explosion or something like that. But when you come across these precursor signs of these chemicals laying around, powders, miscellaneous, stuff like that, that, that should be a red flag. Um, the officer should, should back out out and make the phone call to the local bomb squad. It's important for the responding patrol officer to uh, 
keep the keep as many witnesses and uh, the art reporting party there on scene. Uh, this way, we can question them. Uh, their information is invaluable, especially the witnesses. Uh, if they witness the detonation, uh, how did we'll ask them questions like, "How did it detonate? What color smoke was there?" Because depending on the color smoke, it could depend on it could lead us to what kind of explosive was used. Uh, uh, where did she do the shrapnel? Did anyone say anything before it went off? Did you see anybody running? Different things like that. All this information gathering will help us figure out what kind of device was planted, why the device was planted, and eventually how it was detonated. I think a lot of times when we as peace officers show up in a scene and we see somebody who's, who's injured, we automatically assume that they're a victim. A lot of times, especially in bombing cases, they could be your suspect. Seeing something like a triggering device inside the car, that should be a clue to you. Um, the things like push button switches or uh, personal mobile radios, that type of thing. Those are the type of triggering devices that bombers use to uh, set off remote control devices. You need to be cognizant of that. And it's real important once you start putting the pieces together to let the in other investigating detectives or, or officers know that the person that's at the hospital could possibly be a suspect as opposed to a victim. Keep in mind in a post-blast situation, things are not always as they occur at first blush. Often people don't tell you the true story. Uh, they have some uh, involvement in it themselves. We often see sometimes in a scene that looks like everyone's left that the bomber is still actually around. Uh, so keep an open mind on a post-blast. Record the names of everybody you talk to. Uh, and remember, sometimes that post-blast scene might just be a ruse to get you the first responder there, so keep that in mind. Look around for other suspicious items. Uh, if you have an explosive detection canine, it's a great time to use them to sweep that area where you're staging your equipment. That is definitely the trend in other parts of the world, and that trend is coming this direction. So let's not be lulled in a, into a sense of security at a post-blast scene. Uh, often on a post-blast scene, the bomber likes to see all of the excitement that comes to this incident that he's created. So anyone that's showing an uh, inordinate amount of curiosity about what's going on, asking a lot of questions, that's a great name to record. A uh, great person to ask a couple questions to uh, and, and let that, uh, the bomb squad officers who show up for that scene know who that person is and the type of things that they said to you. You, as the first responder being at scene, you can start watching uh, for uh, any surveillance videos because those uh, are invaluable as far as giving us uh, just a clue as to what exactly happened. A great example is uh, here in San Diego several months ago, we had an explosion at a Hilton hotel that was under construction. And it turned out that one of the uh, cameras uh, at a rail yard across the street was able to capture uh, the explosion in time-lapse photography. And one of the, uh, the biggest uh, dangers that we saw was a huge, what we estimate to be an eight by eight piece of the building that was uh, ejected from the explosion. So surveillance uh, video is, is great. And so try to uh, point those things out to the first arriving bomb tech so that we can start getting some of that vintage footage as soon as possible because we were able to view that particular video within the hour of it happening. And so we were able to really piece it together about the same time as the structural um, and the arson investigators uh, were able to come to the conclusion that it was uh, uh, a gas explosion and nothing maliciously done. If an explosion has gone off and a patrol officer responds, they can set the initial success of the scene by realizing that portions of that device have flown in all directions. They need to quickly get some idea of how far the farthest piece of that device has flown and then go half again that far to set their perimeter. They need to treat it as a crime scene because it is a crime scene and we're going to need to collect all the evidence within that crime scene so they need to control um, people's access to the area. There's going to be a lot of people want to come see what happened. Initially the patrol officer needs to get that perimeter set up good and tight so that evidence is not destroyed by people walking on it um, or removing items prior to the bomb squad being able to investigate it.
One of the considerations when responding to a post-blast scene um, is the fact that when an explosive device, and I'll just say for instance a pipe bomb that may have exploded uh, with uh, at about 3,000 feet per second, uh, the frag and contents of the pipe itself may go considerable distances beyond what you would expect from a normal crime scene. Uh, as a general rule, as bomb technicians and post-blast investigators arriving on a scene, we would take the, the furthest piece of evidence and, and increase that by 50% from the actual seat of the explosion itself as our crime scene. So it, by, by an officer knowing what we expect uh, it may assist in establishing the, the original crime scene and, and perimeter for us when we arrive to investigate. Evidence is critical in order to locate the suspect. And a lot of times, th before the bomb techs even get there, there's been numerous people within the scene. The initial arriving officers, uh, fire, paramedics, hazardous devices teams, other first responders, even citizens have been in that area. It's important to know who was in there have their shoes checked, have the wheels of their vehicles checked, because the tires can carry out evidence. And that may be the one piece you need to solve the puzzle. There's uh, basically three types of blast injuries. The primary, the primary is caused by the blast itself, the pressure wave coming from the explosive. Low explosive, high explosive, they all have blast pressure. And those are the injuries you can sustain from that. The secondary are the blast um, fragmentation, maybe up from the container or from the shrapnel added to the device itself coming at you. Tertiary are actually the ones where you're thrown against something or something falls on you and you're injured that way, such as uh, the Oklahoma City bombing, where a nurse self-checked herself in and started working the scene to try to save victims, and a piece of rebar came down and killed her. Yeah, that was a tertiary um, injury she received. Post-blast injuries can range from burns uh, to severe lacerations, um, puncture wounds from shrapnel or fragments. Um, it can be a loss of hearing from the uh, loud concussion, uh, the burns from the thermal event of uh, the large fireball that may come out of the explosive device. There can also be internal injuries from the blast pressure wave. There may not be an external injury, but the blast pressure wave may have caused injuries internally. The resources that you have to, uh, to consider, and it depends on the th initial threat assessment and the size and the number of injuries involved in the post-blast. If you've got a large incident, you're going to be overwhelmed really quickly, and you may even need federal resources. For the smaller the local person experimenting with pipe bombs and that, you may still need an, uh, numerous resources. It's always good to have a list of those resources, and um, those resources could include fire, paramedics, hazardous devices, teams, crime scene investigators. Um, usually, it's a lot of times, public works is involved to help you block the streets off and redirect traffic. Obviously, additional officers, the bomb squad. Sometimes even force protection is necessary from a SWAT team or some other unit. Utilize your fire personnel. Fire people, uh, fire uh, engines and uh, crews uh, do have a, an intimate knowledge of building construction, lightweight con concrete, uh, standard construction, uh, you know, high-rise I-beam construction. So make sure you get all of your, you know, go ugly early. Bring all the resources you think you might need. It's always uh, great to uh, go ahead and back them down after they get there, but. Uh, uh, if you forget to call somebody, it's going to put some lag time in, in your response because you've forgotten to get someone going. So that's why get everybody you think you might need uh, rolling towards you. And if you can start discounting people or, or sending people back, that's fine. Responding officers should be prepared to deal with victims suffering from a wide variety of injuries at the scene of a bomb blast or explosion. The National Incident Management System has evolved uh, over the last few years, and right now we're in a position where everyone in law enforcement should have been through all of ICS 100, 200, 300, and in some cases the executive and command level 400. And so that it has to become the standard operating system that we are guided by. The National Response Plan calls for us to be conversant in it, to use it, and to be able to abide by it. And the, the fire services have been using it for some time. It is a, an absolute scalable and moldable and modular plan that works very well for uh, all incidents that we are involved in from the law enforcement perspective. 
for instance, if there was a situation at a school and, and it was a large uh, scale, they had to evacuate or, or, or they had to figure out what to do with students, uh, the SIMS-NIMS process comes into effect there where each agency knows, okay, there's certain uh, things they need to take care of. Um, more so than just taking care of the suspicious package of the, itself. We all know is that we need to set up a location for uh, media, and with that, we can also advise the media to advise the parents that there's going to be a separate location to meet their kids, so we, they don't have to come to the location where the problem is and affect our work and mitigating the problem. Generally, when you're talking of any type of explosion. There are going to be numerous resources that are going to respond. You're going to have your fire department. You're going to have evidence people. You'll have people from the Joint Terrorism Task Force wanting to respond to your scene, as well as the FBI, ATF, and many others. So that's something to be cognizant of. And that, that's why it's very important to establish a command post so you can run all those people through that point. And most of the time, your bomb squad is going to coordinate those people for you. ICS is scalable, and what that means is, is that you can start at the lowest level and you can build it, you can expand it, you can go from single incidents to multiple incidents, and it gives a good command structure uh, from the bottom up to the top down and, and conversely from the top down to clear the bottom. And the ability to be able to start off small uh, with just a responding officer or a supervisor or even a lieutenant or take it all the way up to the chain of command, that it gives you the opportunity to be able to bring in and fold in other allied agency partners, especially in unified command situations. And the good majority of what uh, law enforcement is engaged in today, certainly with the emerging threats and with the public safety issue, there's uh, generally a strong probability that we're going to be unified right off the bat with probably our fire authority brothers and sisters. So you're probably going to have a unified command. A post-blast scene investigation often involves numerous agencies and significant resources. The use of the incident command system provides a standardized structure for multi-jurisdictional resources that will be assigned to the incident. One of the necessities that's going to come out of getting all the agencies together, depending on the scale of the incident, is when they're doing their briefing, or some people call it a hot wash, the, the incident commander is going to need to determine the length of the operation periods that they're going to go into effect, at which point they need to start determining what resources have already been requested, what resources have been allocated, and what really they still need to wrap their arms around this incident. So now the hot wash should be pretty much relegated to the initial responders, and the focus on the initial response should be with, with law, fire, uh, if there's other allied agencies, the FBI or participating law enforcement agencies or health, uh, all of those entities need to be involved in it. And also, I mean, if you have public transportation, if you have utilities, if you have uh, uh, venue commanders, meaning uh, the, the various uh, personnel that were in charge of a venue, if you have an area command or if you have private security, those pieces all need to be folded into it, as well as the traffic managers. Every manager, every group supervisor, every director, every section chief that you have should be involved in that hot wash. And the hot wash needs to, to be something that's detailed. And generally speaking, that after those incidents, everyone's exhausted. Now, the, there, there's a trade-off here. I mean, you're going to get um, people that are very tired and want to be able to rush through this. But capturing those nuggets of information that will help us in the future is extremely important. Once a scene has been stabilized or completed, a debrief needs to be done before everyone demobilizes or leaves the scene. A debrief is important even for the smallest scenario. Rarely do we go to a scene and handle it, even as bomb techs, and have everything go perfect. There's always something that could have gone better or had we thought about it, we would do it differently next time. And if we don't sit there and talk about it, and not just with the bomb techs and the first responders, but together, that's, that's how you get the, the most learning for the next incident or the next thing that comes out. And we have a totally different idea on some issues than a patrol officer would have. And they may be wondering why we did something a certain way, and we're wondering why they didn't do something before we got there. And you work those things out and say, oh, well, next time we'll try and do this. 
and if you can do this, this will help us out, and it will make things run smoother, and it's very important. I know most agencies do it for the, that big, major disaster, but if you just do that for the small incident, it's a, it's a great learning tool. The first officer on the scene of an explosion will be the incident commander and will remain in charge until formally relieved. It's important that you know how to establish the incident command system and also know what will happen when others arrive on the scene. Some of the learning points covered in this section include, don't get overwhelmed when you arrive on a blast scene. Be aware that there may be secondary devices. Know the potential hazards at a post-blast scene and how people can be injured. Be sure to retain witnesses and be aware that you may also need to retain suspects. This is a crime scene. Try to preserve all evidence. And be aware of the other resources available to assist you and how they will be used in a unified command. There isn't one thing that a police officer has to think about. We're complex individuals, and these situations are very complex. So the officer can't think about one thing. There's not one thing that the officer has to think about. He has to think, or she has to think about, a myriad of things. But here's a list of them. Number one, get to the scene, take control, unify immediately. Get your arms around the situation, which means get good situational assessment and situational awareness of what you got. It's gonna be conflicting, it's gonna be confounding, and you're gonna to have to sort it out very quickly. You're not gonna have all the information you need, but you're gonna to have to be decisive, you're gonna to have to task various people to do things very, very quickly on limited amounts of information. And sometimes those things be can become paralyzing to individuals, and you have to work beyond that. And then finally, being able to think ahead. In the time that you have, which is a nanosecond to be able to start making uh, judgmental decisions, get good situational awareness, and unify with fire, and to be able to think about what you have to do, is think ahead as to what this next period of time is going to involve. That next period of time may be 10 minutes away, might be 15 minutes away, it could be several days away. The failure to think ahead confounds us all the time because the consequences of that are is that if I need something in 15 minutes, I should have thought about it 15 minutes ago. So not you don't wait till you need it to think about it and to make it happen. You need to be able to start thinking if you need it, you probably will get it there as quickly as you can. If there's one thing that I would like first responders to take away from this training, it is that their local bomb squad is really just a great resource for them. It's just a phone call away. They're there to answer any questions you might have, and they're certainly there to respond whenever they're needed. Do not hesitate to call them. Let them take the heat off of you for some decisions that you really may not be qualified or most likely are not qualified to make. And remember, it's their job to come out, put themselves in danger, and get the incident wrapped up quickly and safely. Don't let yourself become the main character in the next training film shown at briefing at your department because you didn't call the bomb squad and you got seriously hurt or somebody else got seriously hurt because of it. This telecourse has given you some important tools to help you properly react to bomb threats and to situations where explosive devices have gone off. Your safety as a peace officer and the safety of other first responders and the public depends on how well you're prepared and how you quickly assess and control the initial response to such an incident. For the Commission on Peace Officer Standards and Training, I'm Beth Ruyak. Thank you for watching this telecourse on response to improvised explosive devices.